Hello everyone and welcome. Oh, it says I'm muted. Hmm. Let's see. All right, perfect. You guys can hear me okay? Thank you. Hi, I see Jason on. I see Stephanie. Welcome, everyone. Hi. Um, welcome to the International Myeloma Foundation's Facebook Live. Um, we are counting down to the end of Blood Cancer Awareness Month right now, and we have some merchandise to give away today. And we are also... Um, just here to talk about advocacy. Um, hi, I see Monica, I see Gwendolyn, I see Carlton. Welcome everybody. Um, just let me know where you're all coming in from. Um, I'm so excited to see everybody. Welcome. Um, as I said, for the next half hour, we're going to chat about um, advocacy and health policy and all things that in the realm of those things that are impacting the myeloma patients, their families, caregivers. Wow, Orlando, Florida, Jason, Monica from Norway. Wonderful, an international audience, this is fantastic. Oklahoma, Maryland, welcome. So we're, we're just gonna talk about um, health um, policy and patient advocacy tonight. Um, my name's Danielle Doheny and I am the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for the International Myeloma Foundation. Um, I work on the US side and because IMF is truly a global organization, I do also have some wonderful colleagues who work on these issues outside of the US and globally. I see um, multiple folks from um, on the international side, Toronto, um, but I do have colleagues, Mimi and Sadar, who do that amazing work across the globe and I do that in the US. Um, as I mentioned, we put together these this Facebook event um, for Blood Cancer Awareness Month. And we've really been working hard this month to raise awareness of myeloma. Um, it's through our No Myeloma campaign. Um, and I see um, Annabelle from New Jersey. I see Steve from Boca. Oh, I wish I was in Boca right now. It's just raining here like crazy in DC. Australia, welcome. Lots of folks here. So again, we are here um, just to let you know about our No Myeloma campaign. That's K-N-O-W. And you can use this campaign to learn about myeloma, um, anything myeloma related, whether it's the education side, the science side, the advocacy side, even the fundraising side, anything myeloma um, is being promoted through this campaign so that we can really let the world know what myeloma is and the impact our that it has on our patients. Um, so we at the IMF, as you know, we're just here to support you um, through your myeloma journey. And I'm just so excited to talk to you about how we can do that through advocacy. Um, thank you so much. Um, we, we've shared that in the chat. Um, and I guess before you're, we start today, I just wanted to tell folks um, a little bit about my personal story and why um, this is important to me, um, why I really want to help myeloma patients and why I've dedicated my, my career and my life to doing so, um, into shaping public policy in a way that'll help folks that have myeloma. Um, my father is a longtime patient. Um, when he was diagnosed um, more than a decade ago now, his GP um, basically told our family, you know, don't look at those survival stats um, because there's just been so much progress since um, on the drug development side, on the thera therapeutic side, that what you're going to see isn't reflective of what the patient experience is now. Like, you're not going to live that two to five years or less. And that, that, of course, you know, my family, the first thing we do is Google their survival stats. And yeah, spoiler alert, it was really discouraging, not good. Um, but despite um, that, we got our heads together and started to look at more reputable sources for information. We found the IMF and 
found um, he's started with a myeloma specialist and the information we had was much more encouraging. He's lived more than a decade with myeloma. Um, and when he was diagnosed, I was working on Capitol Hill at the time, working healthcare issues um, for a member of Congress. Um, and I just realized oh. that, you know, I really want to help people going through this. Um, and I guess that's why I'm passionate about making sure that people know myeloma and that legislators um, are aware of the patient journey and what's going on with patients. And our ultimate goal is to cure the disease. Um, so we just want our, our stories to be heard by policymakers. And we really ultimately want your voices to be heard in this debate too. Um, it's really important to me that, okay, I go to Capitol Hill on behalf of patients, but unless we have a patient from the district, it's just not um, as helpful. Like they really want to hear from people from from home. And we do have um, the opportunity to give away swag today. I have permission from my higher ups and I'll show you my No Myeloma hat. You could be a proud earner of this hat as well. I see our first question coming in. I see Jason asks, what does oral parity mean? Good question, Jason. Um, oral parity, if you're not familiar with the term, has to do with how much basically patients are paying. I'll give it the patient perspective of it more than the um, in the weeds legislative description of it. A lot of patients who are prescribed oral oncolytic drugs are paying much more for their um, apologies. I had my questions are just have disappeared. They're back. Okay. So patients who are prescribed oral oncolytic drugs are paying significantly more out of pocket than if they were prescribed an IV drug or a drug that they get in their physician's office. So 43 states plus DC have laws that say that if an insurer covers both these oral therapies and these IV therapies, that they have to do so at the same rate. So for example, if it's a copay of $25 to go get your IV chemo, that's how much it'll cost for your oral therapies. And that's really important for the myeloma patient. Um, my dad's been on some of these oral oncolytic drugs um, and his, his out of pocket is pretty high for that. And it's, it's very different than when he goes into, he's been on IV therapies as well. Um, very, very different experience for to not you don't necessarily know how much those I, the um, oral therapies are going to cost because it's something called coinsurance and coinsurance means that a patient is paying the percentage of the cost of the drug, which we all know that's pretty unobtainable unattainable for most patients. Um, folks, um, if it's a you know. I'll just throw out a number for the drug costs a hundred thousand dollars like you might think ten percent of a cost of a drug is nothing when it's a drug that's you know fifty dollars out of pocket but that ten percent of a hundred thousand dollar drug that's not feasible so there is a federal piece of legislation out there called the cancer drug parity act and that would fix it for anybody with a federally regulated health plan um, which would be fantastic it's these um the federally regulated health plans. Um, and I, I know that a lot of folks are on Medicare. So I, I want to also flag how um, some changes in Medicare that are coming that are very positive for patients. Um, so the Medicare program is going under through a restructure. Um, due to a piece of legislation that passed a couple years back called the Inflation Reduction Act. And I wanted to flag for patients in the coming years, there will be an out-of-pocket cap of $2,000 for over the course of that whole year for you. So that would just, I, I know from my folks who are on um, many different therapies, like it's just, it can be, It'll be life-changing to know you only have to pay $2,000. It's not not happening 
right next year, but we do have some educational materials on that, so we're very excited. And we just shared um, an oral parity map. So if you have a state-regulated health plan, for example, like if you work for the state um, or if your employer has a plan that's only in that state, you would benefit from the state plan, but otherwise you would need this um, cancer drug parity bill um, that we have. And let's see, anybody, do I see any other advocacy questions? Absolutely, Alana, thank you so much. The Coalition to Improve Access to Cancer Care is this coalition of cancer advocates, not just myeloma, all across the spectrum. It's us, it's breast cancer groups, it's other blood cancer groups, it's hospitals, it's providers, all kinds of groups um, who are very passionate about passing this oral parity bill. We come together, we meet once a month, and we talk about strategy and how can we move this forward. We talk about like, how can we, does anybody have anyone who can help us meet with this legislator? Like if some, for example, somebody, some organization has a lot of people um, impacted by their disease in a specific state, or if um, they have a lot of just very passionate people there, maybe they um, work closely with a specific member of Congress. And also we, we work together to amplify the patient voice in this scenario. We will bring patients to Capitol Hill. We will do so much um, together. And that's one thing that I think is really beautiful about the cancer community that I don't think everybody has together um, in other disease areas is we are so collaborative. We come together and we um, really just try to amplify each other's voices. We um, There's always a seat at the table for everyone and we ultimately really want the patient voice to be heard. You know, the, the advocacy groups, we can only do so much without the volunteers. The volunteers are really what makes it happen. And I um, just shared here the Myeloma Action Team. Um, and we really, really want to work to amplify the IMFs, um, advocacy program, grassroots program, and have the patient voice come out um, there. And I see another question here from Jason. What would a federal oral parity law do, and is it important? Absolutely, yes. Thank you so much, Jason. It would. It is extremely important. So the reason being, um, it's a little nerdy and in the weeds, but I love this question anyway. Um, and it's something that we have to explain to legislative offices. Um, and it basically different um, types of health insurance are regulated by different bodies. So you have state regulated plans that only the state can say what goes and what doesn't go in the state regulated plans. So if I live in Virginia, my state does have oral parity, but like if you cross um, the border into like, you know, if you go over to North Carolina, they don't have it. That said, I have a federally regulated plan. Even though I live in Virginia, I can't take advantage of that oral parity law that my state has. So I would, if I were diagnosed with cancer and would need an oral oncolytic drug, I would not have oral parity. I would be at the risk of, you know, paying that big copay, depending on, you know, ass assistance, hoping that I qualify for it. Um, so that federal law would help me. So if you work for a company that has maybe employees in multiple states that would be a federally regulated plan, you would need that federal oral parity bill, whether or not your state has a law. So because it's federally regulated versus state regulated. Um, thank you so much, Steve, for flagging. Yes, um, Congressman Scalise, Steve Scalise was just diagnosed my, with myeloma and we um, keep him in our prayers and um, just, yeah, it's, it's, it can impact anybody and, um, and yeah, it's a tr tragedy to when you see 
anyone diagnosed with myeloma, but I, I do can say that like as a patient family member and working at IMF, I just truly appreciate somebody high profile like him who's got the, the ear of reporters of saying, I have myeloma, that just, even just that raises so much awareness. You know, we have had um, lots of stories of, you know, what is myeloma, seeing news stories come out um, about it. Um, so, and that's not just something that Congressman Scalise can do, that's something that we can do something that any patient can do. You can write a letter to the editor about what is myeloma or like what um, access issues you've had. Anybody can raise awareness. So I, I really um, appreciate that. And, and I know not everybody likes to raise awareness and putting my name out there, but anybody can, you know, we have opportunities to send emails to legislators. We have opportunities that even at just a click of a button, they'll send out something called an action alert. You get the email, you click send. If you want to, you can put a personal story in. If you want to, you can forward it to your friends and family to send on. Um, we try to make it easy and we also try to make it so that whatever level of engagement you are comfortable in, that you can do. Whether that's, you know, I'm gonna go meet with a legislator We'll prep you for that, so don't be intimidated. Um, if you say that's something you want to do and come to us, we will get you trained up. And we really are um, working to um, amplify our action team. We just we did have our first meeting. We're hoping to have more. Um, we kind of kicked the can down the road for our second meeting, just with like shutdown, showdown, and everything there. But we did produce a video that you can see on the Action Team website of kind of Advocacy 101. So if that's something you're interested in and but you don't quite know what it is, you can watch our Advocate, our 101 video and then from there um, email me. And even if you like see, you don't have to, you can join the Action Team and not do everything that we have um, on the page. Like you don't have to meet with legislators if you don't want to. You don't have to share your story. You can send, just be a voice for your support group of saying, this is what's going on, or just a voice to other patients or to your families, what's going on. And I see a, a question that just came in about the IMF talks about congressionally directed medical research. What is that? That is a fantastic question and something I'm really excited about. It's been a really, um, something I can point to that's been a great success um, that the IMF um, um, led the, the charge to achieve. So the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program is a program run by the Department of Defense that does um, research essentially on whatever topics Congress says that they are to do research on. So. Our mission was to make sure that myeloma and the blood cancers were included. And I see, um, I'm actually just going to work this in with Jack's question too. I see um, Jack, this honestly, this is, excites me like to see a question about collaboration because yes, Jack, the IMF does work with LLS advocacy um, a lot. We go to the Hill with them on the specific issue of congressionally directed medical research. Um, we come together and decide the strategy of how are we going to ask this? How are we going to work on this together? And I, my dog clearly has opinions about the congressionally directed medical research program because he's barking at something. Um, that's Nigel. But we do work very closely with LLS on this. We um, have shared spreadsheets and everything and we do the visits to Congress together. We also um, work with the Department of Defense themselves um, to recruit patients to serve as consumer reviewers for this program. So this program is really unique in that it's not just researchers saying, you know, this is what I think should be researched or this is the best science. They come to the table with what is the best science and then they bring patients to the table as consumer reviewers to say, this is what's relevant to me. I know that this is all great science, but I don't care about this or this or this. This isn't gonna impact my quality of life at all, but this will. So the patient voice is really heard 
within the CDMRP program. And if anybody's interested in serving as a consumer reviewer, let me know because we as the IMF, along with LLS, we, we come together and we will recommend patients to the Department of Defense to help you fill out that application. And the Department of Defense keeps that on file for whenever they need folks to act as consumer reviewers. Um, and it's not something, you don't have to be a scientist to do it. You just have to have the perspective of a myeloma patient or a caregiver or a family member. You, you, they'll, the, the DOD, they'll come in and say, you know, anything that needs to be said um, in terms of like what you need to look out for, like they'll, te they'll train you for everything that's, and it, it's a truly um, powerful program. We've had um, great feedback from the Department of Defense on the patients that we have sent to them as well. They've been very excited about um, the contributions of the myeloma community to the program, so, especially since we are a newer disease within the program. Um, so, and, and I just wanted to also plug like the IMF, um, doesn't just you know go for this research program or this research program um we will push you know nih funding cdc funding um nci and anything that we think will impact the, the myeloma patient we are out there saying increase the funding here like do this help us here and that's something that patients can be involved in too you can um say like, hey, this is important to me, and we can get you into that, to a meeting with, it, it will help us too, to actually have a patient say like, this is why this is important. Like I can say like, this is important to me because myeloma doesn't have a cure and my dad has it and I want to see a cure. But if you have somebody, if, we're, if I'm visiting a congressman from, for example, like Georgia, I'm not from Georgia. They want somebody from Georgia to say, this is why this is important. And I see another question that just came in from Jason and how influential can a consumer reviewer be? You know, I haven't served as one myself, but I hear from many patients that it's a very rewarding process to be involved in, to have that say um, in what research gets funded. Um, yeah, and I, I think like if they had a negative um, perception of it, there wouldn't be folks that were coming and saying like this was a positive experience. We, anybody that we've spoken with who has done this has felt it's been um, rewarding and I think, um, yeah, it's been positive. Um, and that's just one way to get involved. Like if you hear consumer reviewing, like, nah, not for me, there are other um, involvement with federal agencies that we can give people's names to. Um, there's also just with us, like um, we we want to hear what you have to say, and even if you don't say like, you can say I'm not comfortable doing any of that. You can just give me a call, talk with me, and whenever I meet with legislators, I share stories that I hear that with your permission, obviously. But if you tell me your story, and I hear and there's certain legislator that I think you know they need to hear this, I I will take it to them and make sure they know. Um, so that's something that's, um, we, we really want to make sure you're, here, you're heard. Um, do we have any other questions? No, not yet, okay. Oh, we do. Yes, so I see, um, thank you, Jack. He um, just answered Jason's question. He says, I've been a reviewer, Jason, and offering the patient perspective carries a lot of weight in these grant reviews. Amazing. Thank you, Jack. So if anybody buddy has an interest in doing this, like it's it's rewarding and it's it carries a lot of weight. Um, and you can email me anytime at advocacy at myeloma .org. Um, Always willing to try to set up a time to talk on the phone, um, respond to your email. Again, this is um something that getting, getting folks involved is just so important. And IMF really, really wants to um, amplify that. And Dr. Dury talks about myeloma and first responders. Has the IMF done any work regarding this? Yes, they have. Um, 
and this was a little bit before my time, but I, the IMF was very active during the passage of the James Zadroga Act for 9-11 first responders. And we also have endorsed legislation um, related to firefighters, um, veterans. We definitely, Dr. Dury has um, shared a lot of um, amazing work and points about um, this, how myeloma does impact the first responders and individuals who have faced toxic exposures. And that's actually something that we do take to um, Capitol Hill when we're advocating for things, even like the CDMRP, because we, we take that data and the antidotes over to the legislators because that's something they need to know um, that those who served our country, those who served their communities are getting this disease more often than the general public. And we really owe it to them to dig in and research this and make sure that these people um, who have been impacted negatively by the service that they did with a myeloma diagnosis are taken care of. Um, so absolutely, um, the IMF does value that. Um, and we, we follow any piece of legislation out there that might mention, you know, toxic exposures, myeloma, and if it's something that would really impact our community, we'll endorse that. And um, we also will toss out something called an action alert. I mentioned that a little bit ago. An action alert is just um, a pre-prepared opportunity for you to click a button and send a, a link, um, a letter to your member of Congress from um, you, um, and it has our words there, but you also it has room for you to edit them, make it however you want, um, add your personal story in there. Um, so if you, if you want to learn more, visit myeloma.org. And again, um, thank you so much to everyone for joining today. Um, yeah, I, I'm just excited to give out the swag. And I guess before we close, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining me. Again, my name's Danielle Doheny, Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for the IMF. Um, and just remember the whole point of our visit tonight, we really want to spread awareness for myeloma. And we want people to know myeloma. So please visit myeloma.org to learn more about know my, knowing myeloma and just share that with everyone, um, share the message and anybody who gets their swag from their question, wear it out. Um, when I wear my myeloma gear, I get questions about it. Sometimes you'll have people who'll be like, melanoma? And then you can say no and tell them about myeloma. Um, it's really important um, that we are a recognized disease and just from my personal experience it's something that I hadn't heard of. it was a decade ago but before my dad was diagnosed I hadn't heard of it so we have an opportunity to know myeloma thanks everyone